I'm Kelly Barron's Brink. This is True Crime IRL. True crime in real life. Today I'm going to discuss the Iowa Hotel homicides. This is a series of murders against women committed in the mid to late 1990s by a serial killer in the Des Moines, Iowa area. His name was Donald Piper and boy have I got a story to tell you. In 1993, Patricia Lang, or Patty, as I'm going to call her through this podcast episode, was living in Colorado with her boyfriend of 12 years, Toby Roycroft. She was a really smart woman. She was independent and educated, and she was everything that a strong woman would aspire to be. She was very career-oriented, and she had a great job in Colorado, and she was really good at what she did. But she was looking to move up in her career, and she couldn't do that in her current position in Colorado. So she accepted a job that would take her to the Des Moines, Iowa area. And this was a big promotion for Patty, so she was really excited. As I said before, she had been with her boyfriend for over a decade, so she asked him to move with her to Iowa, but he just really wasn't into the idea. So he chose to stay in Colorado. But her career was very important to her, so she picked up and she moved to Iowa anyway. And good for her. Women are so frequently held back by their relationships, and this decision that she made tells me that her independence and her own goals were extremely important to her. So in the process, she temporarily had to stay at a hotel for about a week to 10 days or so before her apartment was ready to move into. So she was staying in the hotel, kind of getting ready, getting acquainted with the city of Des Moines, getting ready for her big new job. And the hotel she was staying at was the West Des Moines Holiday Inn. If you're not familiar with Iowa and with Des Moines, West Des Moines, it's a really nice area. It's, it's suburban, it's safe. They have good restaurants, good shopping, and it's very family friendly. Des Moines is the largest city in Iowa and West Des Moines is just kind of like a little suburban offshoot of that. The West Des Moines Holiday Inn is not some seedy rent by the hour dump. It's, it was always a nice hotel as far as I know. And it's one of those hotels that has like a big atrium in the middle with plants and fountains and a big glass elevator. There are several ballrooms where people have their wedding receptions and their meetings and conventions. And while it's not the Four Seasons, it is a nice hotel with a good reputation, or at least it was back in the day. Patricia was a really classy businesswoman and she was staying in a nice place, just so you can picture it. When I look at pictures of Patty, I think she's really a natural beauty. She's got big brown eyes, she's got brown hair, and I kind of think she resembles Hilary Swank. She's just a pretty lady. She's fit and tall and slim, and she's got a great smile. So she's living in this hotel, temporarily staying there while she gets her apartment ready and things like that. And it was August in Iowa which I feel is a beautiful time. It's warm and it's sunny and the days last a long time. There's sunshine until I would say 9 or 9.30 at night and it's, it's just a great time to be in Iowa. She was ready to start a new job in a new city and I can just imagine that she was super excited. So it was a lazy summer Sunday evening and Patty had been doing some laundry that night since, you know, she was staying there for over a week. She had some laundry to do and she did her laundry and then she came back up to her room. She folded her clothes, she folded her socks and her underwear and she neatly placed everything in a basket on her bed. And that folded basket of clothing would be there the next morning when housekeepers found Patty's dead body on the floor of her hotel room. On Monday morning, August 23rd, 1993, Patty Lang was found dead in her hotel room by the maids who were coming by to clean her room. 
She was found lying near the bed with her wrists bound together in front of her with a strip of torn white pillowcase, and a similar cloth ligature was wrapped around her neck and her mouth. A second ligature, which was a bent coat hanger used as a makeshift garrot, was looped around her neck and coiled tightly from behind. An autopsy later revealed that the cause of death was due to ligature strangulation. So, a garrot is a weapon that's used to strangle victims, and it can be made out of many different materials, including rope or cloth or cable ties, guitar strings, I mean, any kind of cord or rope. So, it's like typically wrapped around some sort of wooden handle or something, and it's twisted around, and then it's just turned around like a propeller until the wire is so tight that the victim can no longer breathe. And you may have heard the term garrot before. A garrot was the murder weapon that was also used in the Jean Benet Ramsey case, where the six-year-old little girl was strangled to death with a garrot fashioned out of a piece of nylon cord and a paintbrush. So Patty's murderer in this case tightened the coat hanger around her neck again and again and again, which ultimately caused her death. She had also been brutally raped, and she was completely naked from the waist down, except for her socks and her tennis shoes. Strangely, no articles were missing from Patty's room, and her wallet, which contained $209, was left in her open briefcase, visible to anyone who walked in the room. Her hotel room key was found on the floor near her body. Investigators found no bolt damage to the door and no damage to the door jam either, which would have indicated that the door had been pried open or forced open. As there was no evidence of any forced entry, investigators initially theorized that Patty knew her killer and had voluntarily let him into her hotel room. Her beaten and battered body was found posed on the floor in a way where she was kind of parallel with the bed with her face tilted out so she was staring at whoever would walk in and find her. Police noted that this may have been intentional so that there would be some major shock factor when her body was found. Patty Lang was very close to her family and they had an amazing relationship. In fact, She moved from Colorado to Iowa to be closer to her family. It wasn't just for the job, and it wasn't just for the promotion, but she wanted to be closer to her family who lived in Wisconsin at the time. Sometimes when you hear of a murder in the news, you think, well, that would never happen to me. They must have lived some sort of crazy life or knew really crazy people. Well, I can assure you that Patty was completely normal. She was like any of us, and if this randomly could happen to her, it could literally happen to anyone. It's very sad that right before she was starting a new chapter of her life, her life was taken from her so viciously. And speaking of viciousness, that's how I would describe the way several officers reacted at the crime scene. It would be noted later during Patty's murder trial that state agents mocked the homicide victim as she lay dead and naked from the waist down on the floor of her hotel room. As they were recording crime scene investigation footage, the videotape showed Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation agents laughing about the condition of Lang's underwear, making fun of her bra size, and just making lots of jokes about her car, and just a lot of terrible comments. Public Safety Commissioner Penny Westfall later would say, Jokes sometimes ease the tension in a gruesome scene. Certainly in no way do we ever want to offend people with comments we make. And while I do understand Gallo's humor, it's still kind of gross and shitty in this case, just saying. It's very cringeworthy. I know that a lot of law enforcement and autopsy technicians, 911 dispatchers, and people who are in those types of careers, I understand that they see some of the most desperate and hopeless situations there are, but the fact that it was all caught on tape is just, I don't know, very unpleasant. 
So when a businesswoman with no ties to crime or anything crazy like that is brutally murdered with so much rage, and this was a crime with a lot of rage in it, it leaves investigators wondering who could have done this. And they started thinking pretty much right off the bat was, oh, let's check with the boyfriend because as you true crime fans know, it's pretty much always the boyfriend, the husband, the spouse, the lover. It's almost always someone with close ties to the victim. So Patty's boyfriend was still living in Colorado at the time of her murder, and they had a good relationship, but with the move, you know, things were sort of strained, and they thought maybe there could be some connection. So they immediately started investigating Toby Roycroft, the boyfriend, and they asked him to take a polygraph test. He said yes. But in my opinion, ugh, don't ever take a polygraph test. They can really only hurt you. They don't help you. They're not admissible in court. And it's, to me, just kind of like voodoo pseudoscience. Voodoo? Did I say voodoo? Voodoo pseudoscience. Sorry, too much wine. And in this case, it really did not help Toby at all because he took the polygraph test and it showed up as inconclusive. So it did not rule him out as a suspect at all. So they had him take a second polygraph test and guess what? Again, it came back inconclusive. And another thing that made Toby look really bad was he was the primary beneficiary on Patty's life insurance and he was the executor of her will. He stood to gain a lot of money in her death. So investigators thought he was looking pretty guilty. So the next thing they wanted to look into was, did any of Toby's DNA show up at the crime scene? They wanted to know if any of the DNA evidence they collected might be linked to Toby. And here's a part of the story that gets a little gross, as if a gruesome murder scene wasn't enough already. As I said before, not only was Patty brutally murdered, but she was also raped. So investigators were trying to get DNA from any source they could in the hotel room that might match the DNA that was found on her body. And so you guys know what happens in hotel rooms. Uh, you don't usually just go there to play a game of cards. Some people go there to sleep, but some people visit a hotel room to get their freak on. And where do they do that? Well, probably all over the hotel room, but also on the bed. So they took samples of Patty's bedspread, and guess what they found? Stains. Lots and lots and lots of stains. In fact, they found 108 stains. 108 DNA samples. And guess how many of them were semen stains? Well, 38. Yep. So there were 38 unique individual semen stains on Patty Lang's hotel bedspread. 38 people had had sex on that bedspread and left their bodily fluids behind. I was shocked at the number of stains that were actually on that bedspread. One of the things you, you don't realize in staying in lots of hotels, many times the bedspreads are multicolored. And so unless you look very closely, you don't realize the number of stains that could be on a bedspread. Obviously, the fact that I had this many different individuals, semen stains, and different females' DNA on that, it appeared to me it had been quite a while since that bedspread had been washed. They said it could be up to once a year. Guys, the first thing I do when I go to a hotel is I peel back the bedspread, fold it and nicely take it off because it's freaking disgusting. You don't want to sit on somebody's DNA stains and you definitely don't want to have your kids on that bed. And the hotel verified that yeah, they only wash their bedspreads maybe once a year or so. So that's why there were so many stains on that bedspread because guys, Hotels don't wash their bedspreads. They change the sheets, they change the other bedding, but they do not wash their bedspreads. So this is a great lesson when you go traveling. Don't let your kids around the bed. Don't sit down. Don't make yourself comfortable. Take off that damn bedspread first. 
Okay, I have said my piece. Moving on. So they tested these stains and none of them were a match for Toby Roycroft, the boyfriend. His DNA was nowhere to be found in Patty's hotel room, and after thoroughly vetting him in a number of other ways, they ended up ruling him out as a suspect. So they started investigating Patty's life a little more thoroughly. They were just looking for anyone who could have had a motive to kill Patty. They stumbled across a man who she worked with who they thought could have maybe been tied to it. He was actually someone who Patty had worked with for a really long time. They just worked in separate offices in separate locations. So they did know each other, and it was kind of speculated that maybe they had some sort of office romance going on, even though she had a boyfriend in Colorado. They were kind of wondering if maybe, possibly, she might have come to Iowa a little bit for him. But that lead led to nothing. He was found to have absolutely nothing to do with her death, and there was no office romance going on between them. Which again, left detectives stuck with no leads, and they just came across dead end after dead end. There were a few tips and potential cracks in the case, but nobody that they suspected turned out to be linked to the DNA that was found on Patty's body or the DNA that was found on the bedspread. They just weren't finding anybody. They started questioning people and eventually they did come across the name of a man who was kind of a disgruntled former employee of the Holiday Inn. They wondered if maybe he could have been linked to the hotel during the time Patty was staying there. He was the former chief maintenance man at the hotel during that time, and his name was Donald Piper. My understanding is that he had been fired from his job for having an affair with a co-worker who worked as a maid at the hotel. He was pretty pissed about getting fired from his job, but he moved on to another job at a heating and cooling company, and that's where he was working by the time police came to question him. He had a pretty solid alibi, and he had family and friends to back him up. His wife corroborated his story that he was home all night with his family and with his kids, and they pretty much ruled him out at that point as a suspect. As time went on, there were lots of reports, though, of weird guys who had been spotted at the hotel. At one point, a young girl reported that she had an experience that really frightened her at the hotel. She was followed down a hallway by a man who was kind of chasing her, and that experience really shook her up. The police took her story very seriously, and they actually even had her help with creating a composite sketch of the man. The man had a mustache, and he actually looked a lot like the maintenance man that they had recently interviewed, Donald Piper. They just didn't know at that point that Piper could have been linked to the murder. Another theory that they toyed with was maybe the person who killed Patty had been in town for the Iowa State Fair. A lot of people come from different states and different areas to go to the Iowa State Fair. It's kind of a big deal in the Midwest. There are thousands of attendees as well as vendors who make a living by traveling from fairs to fairs across the United States. I'm not going to say the word carny, but if the shoe fits? Anyway, they thought that maybe it was someone who came there for the fair, but they had no additional leads and nothing to go on. So they closed the book on that idea and they just kept moving forward. There were a few small leads here and there, but most of them were not solid and there was nothing worthy of pursuing. And eventually, Patty's case turned into a cold case. With no leads and no DNA matches, nearly four years went by and then another woman was murdered in a hotel. On September 4th, 1997, Zuri Yeda Sakanovich, a Bosnian refugee who had recently come to the United States with her family, was found murdered in another hotel room. Zuri Yeda was a 21-year-old maid at the Budgetel Inn in the nearby suburb of Clive, Iowa. 
She got along great with her coworkers, and she was a really hard worker. She had escaped just terrible circumstances in Bosnia, and she and her family felt so much hope coming to the United States. But that all ended in September of 1997, when a co-worker found her body in the room she had been cleaning. She was found dead and bloody, and in fact, that co-worker that found her said she had never seen so much blood in her entire life. Zurieta was tortured and beaten. She was bound with tape and she was stabbed to death. Her former co-worker recalls the experience. First intuition felt was wrong. Either she left in a hurry or, you know, something had happened because they was trained to keep their car up against their door. She had blood all over her face. And my first initial thought was run and get her help. I had never seen like so much blood in my life. So in this case, there were many similarities to Patty Lang's murder scene. Zurieta's body was posed, kind of like Patty's was, with her body parallel to the floor and her face facing outward to greet whoever stumbled upon her. Police felt in their gut immediately when they found her that this death was linked to the death of Patty Lang. They felt like the same person who killed Patty probably killed Zurieta. However, they were unable to find any DNA evidence at the crime scene. They felt like they were dealing with the same guy, but they just couldn't verify who that guy was. So Patty was killed in 1993. Zurieta was killed four years later in 1997. And four years is a lot of time to go by and a lot of time for technology to advance, which it did. And the crime labs working on each of these cases just collected as much DNA evidence as they could, as much evidence as they could in general. Investigators drew out a timeline and went back to the days that Patty Lang had been staying at the hotel. They did their best to track down as many of the hotel guests and staff as they could. They wondered who would have been at the hotel around the time of her death, and they sent questionnaires to these people, and they also requested DNA samples from them. This gave them a lot of information and a lot of DNA, and they were thrilled when they found out that one of the samples of DNA they had obtained was a match to some of the DNA stains that were found on Patty Lang's bedspread. Those matched samples belonged to the man who was the hotel maintenance chief at the time, Donald Piper, who they had already talked to. They immediately felt in their gut that Piper could very well be their killer. So they questioned him as to why his DNA was found at the crime scene. However, Donald Piper had an elaborate explanation, and it's gross, and wait till you hear this. He says, this is Don Piper, can I talk to you? And I said, absolutely, what's up? And that's when he explains the reason why his DNA potentially could be in that Pat Lang's motel room is because he went into every room in that hotel and masturbated in every room. I've masturbated in the bedroom, I've masturbated in, in the bathroom, I've masturbated everywhere. You know, I've got to understand he indicated his semen could be anywhere on the bedspreads, it could be on the walls, ceiling, the floor, it didn't matter. Since DNA is not time stamped, there's no way to disprove Piper's explanation. We were essentially left with a dilemma. Is it possible he could have been in that room and they left his DNA on the bedspread? prior to the homicide having taken place? The answer to that is yes. Donald Piper also told investigators that he and his wife stayed in room 732 on New Year's Eve and that they had sex on the bedside. So that was another explanation he gave for why his semen would be on that bedside. That was Police Chief John Quinn speaking in a recorded conversation with Donald Piper, and yeah, you heard him right. Piper said that he had literally masturbated in every single room of the hotel, and that's how his DNA got on Patty Lang's bedspread. He went on further to say that he spent New Year's Eve the year before in the same hotel room where Patty Lang was found murdered, which was room number 732. 
He said that he and his wife had sex all over the hotel room, all over the bedspread, and spread their DNA everywhere in that room. That's a little too convenient, don't you think? So even though this explanation is outlandish and sounds ridiculous, it was an explanation. And there was really no other evidence linking him to the actual crime, and investigators didn't have enough evidence to place him under arrest for the murders. I find that really hard to believe, but that's how it all went down. And this is going to make you really mad, because before there was enough evidence, and I say that in air quotes, enough evidence, to arrest Donald Piper in the murder of these two women, there was a third victim. Mariana Redravan was just 15 years old, and she was an Ecuadorian refugee who came to the United States and began working as a hotel maid at the West Des Moines Walnut Creek Inn. She was found stabbed to death in the hotel room that she had been cleaning, just like Zurayeda had been. Not only was she stabbed to death, she was stabbed 47 times. Like I said, she was only 15 years old and she was just a child. She presented a fake ID in order to gain employment in the U.S. stating that she was 17 years old, but no, she was just 15. At just 15 years old, a child, an actual child, this girl was working 32 hours a week at $6 an hour to support her parents, siblings, and other relatives. In Mariana's case, there was absolutely no DNA found at the crime scene. There was no DNA evidence, and they could not conclusively link Donald Piper to this case. But, just like all the other cases, Mariana was found naked from the waist down, with her wrists bound, and she was stabbed and presumably sexually assaulted. Investigators never did say whether Redravan was strangled like the others, and while there are a lot of similarities in the slayings, police never confirmed whether they were committed by the same person. By now, years had gone by, and the murderer, who was preying on all these women in these hotels, had gained a lot of confidence in his skills, and he was able to remain anonymous, basically. Investigators did not want another murder to happen on their watch. So they began tailing him, following him, day and night, relentlessly, for months. Every step he took, they were behind him, watching. Donald Piper did not like being watched. He didn't like being tailed, and he put up a fight. In fact, he turned the tables on those people who were investigating him, and he started to stalk them. Despite a mountain of circumstantial evidence, it still isn't enough for a conviction. Piper remains at large, free to murder at will. They were not going to allow us to go ahead to arrest Don Piper. So that put the burden on our investigative team to watch him 24-7. It wasn't a uh, hidden surveillance. Uh, they wanted Donald Piper to know that law enforcement was watching because we did not want a repeat of any of the prior murders. <laughs> The police surveillance enrages Piper, who retaliates by turning the camera on them. He uh, became very verbally abusive. He uh, came running up to one of the patrol cars. Uh, he would videotape law enforcement following him. So he was beginning to feel the pressure that law enforcement was putting on him. Piper went so far as to follow one of the state troopers who was working on his case, finding out where he lived and driving by when the officer's kids were playing outside. He made threatening phone calls to this particular officer and did his best to make that officer's life a living hell. He was really throwing out the serial killer vibe, and he was good at it. He was a dangerous man, and he wanted everyone working on his case to know that he had no qualms about harming them or their loved ones if he had the chance. 
However, investigators did not give up. They kept looking for a solid lead that would bring them closer to being able to make an arrest of Donald Piper. And in the process, they were able to find more evidence from items they recovered at the crime scenes. They found a semen stain on Patty Lang's sock that she was wearing when she was killed. They also found a drop of blood on Zurieta Sakanovich's clothing that did not belong to her. They were able to test these additional DNA samples that they found, and eventually they did get a match to Donald Piper. So while for a little while Donald Piper's masturbation explanation held up and bought him some time, there was absolutely no explanation as to why or how his DNA could have ended up on these two murder victims. Police finally had enough evidence to arrest Donald Piper. But just because investigators had evidence they needed to make an arrest, it did not mean this trial was going to be a sure thing. One of Donald Piper's trials ended in a mistrial due to botched evidence handling on the part of the investigation team. And then there was a change of venue in another trial due to the sensationalistic aspect of the crime. Another trial came back with nearly a hung jury as 10 jurors voted guilty and one voted innocent. There was some controversy regarding whether that should have been declared a mistrial or not, and some speculated that that final juror's guilty decision was a coerced act. There were just numerous delays and mistakes throughout the case that nearly ended in Donald Piper seeing freedom. At one point, trials had to be delayed because Piper was deemed mentally incompetent to withstand trial. A psychiatrist prescribed two entire months of drug therapy to get him into decent enough mental shape to be able to move forward. And knowing what I know about this guy, knowing what a cunning, manipulative liar he is, I really feel like this is just a delay tactic on his part to buy more time. Ultimately, though, he was finally convicted in 2001 and again in 2002 at a separate trial of first-degree murder in the two separate cases of Patty Lang and Zurieta Sarkanovich. Unfortunately, Mariana Redravan's family would never gain the same closure that these other two families had because they were never able to convict Donald Piper of her murder due to lack of evidence. So that's the story of Donald Piper, serial killer in the Des Moines, Iowa area. He took the lives of Patty Lang, Zurieta Sarkanovich, and we unofficially know that he also killed Mariana Redrovan. So that's the end of the story. Thanks for listening. Have a good day. Oh wait, sorry. No, that's not actually the end at all. There's a lot more to it. So we know that Donald Piper most likely killed the first three women, but the late 1990s in the Des Moines, Iowa area were full of murder and mystery. And most likely, it's linked to Donald Piper. There are numerous still unsolved cold cases today that involve unsolved murders of women in the Des Moines, Iowa area in the late 1990s that are probably attributed to Donald Piper. And we will get into those stories next time in part two of the Iowa Hotel Homicides. Thank you for listening to True Crime IRL, true crime in real life. I'm Kelly Barron's Brink, and I can't wait to see you again next time. Until then, lock your doors, people, please. Just lock your doors. Lock them. Lock those doors. Bye-bye. <laughs>